Today in part 10 of our series on the life and ministry of Paul, we look at strength and weakness. One of the greatest ironies of life is that often those who appear strong are often weak, and those who appear weak are often strong. Here's Greg Garza. Our, 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 our topic today uh, in, in Paul's life is, is, is pretty serious, and it's, it, it represents a situation in, in his life, as I see it, moving toward his, his final days. Um, the situation in his trial before Agrippa, and, and then the trip to Rome on the ship, all those things kind of represent the, the twilight years, if you will. And um, we're going to look at that uh, time before Agrippa and, and kind of analyze it. And I'm going to do it uh, Greg's way, surprise. Uh, and I hope that uh, you'll share with me my, my, uh, my perspectives, okay? Now, there's been a song running through my mind now for... I don't know how many days, maybe weeks. The lyric line, it, it's, a, it's a song you're all familiar with, This is Amazing Grace. And the line starts, who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The king of glory, the king above all kings. And then the refrain is, this is amazing grace. And the second part, this is unfailing love. Over and over again. And I... I thought about this as I was doing my study in, in uh, Acts for this message because uh, we see Paul in the beginning as my, my take, not a very nice guy. I don't even think the Jews liked him. That's just my perspective on him. I believe he was self-righteous and uh, uh, conceited, full of himself, and so when we, we unpack these two episodes, we're, we're going to see the change, the, the evolution, if you will. Is that a bad word? We're going to see the movement of, <laughs> of Paul from uh, being a, a, a king of, of those who persecuted the church to a, a, a stalwart apostle of the Lord. And something caught my, my attention. Do um, you remember what, after the uh, conversion experience, Paul was... Oh, well, Ananias was praying one day, and the Lord, you know, came to him and said, Ananias, I want you to go and, and meet Paul. And uh, Ananias was less than excited about it and uh, said, you know, this is the guy who's trying to wreck the church, Lord. Are you really sure about this? And what does he say? Jesus says, go to this man. He is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, their kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And I bring that up because suffer has a couple of meanings. One is to be subjected to something bad or unpleasant, and the other is to tolerate or endure. And as we look at Paul's life from this point forward, from the conversion experience, the Lord works in his life and causes him to experience episodes and, and trials that mold him into the man that we see by the time he comes to Agrippa. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, and I'm interactive, so I'm going to be asking questions like that. It's my sales background. That's called a trial close. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if I ask you, does that make sense, please somebody uh, say amen or, you know, if I can get a witness. All right. Okay. So what, did, what was Paul doing before the conversion experience? Oh, just pretty much persecute, persecuting the, the, uh, the church. I, I kind of see him, and I don't know if you can picture in your mind's eye, him in full rabbi attire. Do you remember the hats and the robes and all the things that the guys, uh, the, the, the chief priests used to wear, at least the ones I've seen in the movies, they look pretty decked out and kind of walking around being cool or pretending to be one way or the other. And the thing that strikes me about this is, is that our God is a God of love, and I don't see the behavior of Paul and the Jews at that time as reflecting that love. Now, I, I know that they were sincere. I know that they believed that what they were trying to do, and trying to live by the law, was in fact the way that they were supposed to live. But I just don't see how that could be attractive to people, even the Jews. How many mitzvahs are they? Everybody know what a mitzvah is? 
It's one of the rules, traditions that the, that the, uh, the elders made up. There are over 600 of them. That's what you had to live by. That's a pretty tough road to hoe. So I don't see Paul being, you know, Mr. Congeniality. Oh, did I tell you the good news about this message? It's not going to last that long. <laughs> so he persecuted the church. He jailed the believers. Uh, he consented to the murder of, of believers. We know the story of Stephen, the first martyr. He was so obsessed that he was granted the authority to go to churches throughout um, what was then the Middle East to persecute believers in those churches also. So, kind of picture in your mind what's been going on here. He's, he's come to the point where he's now on his way to Damascus to arrest believers and, and persecute those over there. So he, he and his entourage are moving down the road to Damascus and a bright light and a voice. And the Lord speaks to him. Now picture in your mind, because we're talking about, I don't know if I said this or not, he is now before Agrippa, okay? The, the Jews have arrested him or had him arrested. He's in Caesarea and he's standing trial for his belief in the Lord and for the resurrection, uh, belief in the re resurrection of the dead. And uh, Festus has brought him before King Agrippa so that he can make his defense. And so Paul now is in a situation, uh, and I'm going to call it an opportunity, okay? And that's kind of how I see what happened here. Looking at it from the outside, it looks like just a straight trial, okay? But I, you know, by this time, Paul is a seasoned evangelist and apostle. And I got to believe in my heart of hearts that when he knew he was going to before, go before the, the king, he said, yes, okay? This is my opportunity to share the word of God, to share the gospel in, in such a way that few people will ever have a chance to do, okay? And that's exactly what he did. He got up and he, he, in that opportunity, he shared uh, what came out of the Old Testament through the prophets and, and tried to convince, or so Agrippa thought, convince him that uh, Jesus was in fact the Messiah. Interestingly enough, if you can picture what I just described as Paul in the beginning, as that man who was self-absorbed, what he was like at the time when he comes into the trial. Okay, he walks in. Uh, I believe it says in the Bible that he was in chains. I'm guessing he probably didn't smell that hot, um, dirty. And and now he's before King Agrippa. What's he like? Remember what he was like before? Not so nice. Okay, what is he like now? He's calm, he's polite, he's respectful. He's a completely different man. And he starts easily enough with points of agreement with the Jewish leaders about uh, the resurrection of the dead and the hope of a Messiah. And there's quiet. Just as an aside, I found it interesting as you read these, this part of, of Acts, there's no comment from the Jews on any part of this. I would have thought that they would be, you know, kind of gnashing their teeth and making noises to let them know of their disapproval of him. Okay? But he turns to uh, the king and then he describes his conversion and he talks specifically about what Lord Jesus was going to charge him to do. What I call it, at this point in time, he gets his marching orders. You are a servant and a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I will send you to the Gentiles to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, to turn them from the power of Satan to God, so that you may receive, they may receive forgiveness of sins and a, pl a place among the righteousness, those who are sanctified by faith in me. Everything that he says here has to grate on the Jewish leaders. Okay. the opportunity to present these points of view and, and the things that he's going to say to essentially a Gentile, because that's what I believe Agrippa was, 
is that opportunity to begin to present the gospel, much the way that, that we are charged to do today. Fortunately, we don't have to do it in front of the king. What gives Paul the ability to do that? That, to me, is the measure of where he was at the beginning and where he is when he's standing in front of the king. What happened to Paul? We talked about the word suffer. Has he had any trials? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. He was flogged. What else? Say again. Kill stone. Not yet. But soon. <laughs> he has suffered, okay? And he's persevered through all of this. And, and what I find so compelling is, is that what drives someone to be able to maintain their faith through all of that? And the reason I say it that way is because we don't have to do our, our witnessing before a king or maybe not somebody powerful. And yet we let the things that happen in our, our daily week distract us from our focus on what's most important. The king of kings, the king above all kings. So I'm, I'm suggesting to you that what drove him is the love of God and the love for God. And I believe that his practice, his, his uh, way of life is what grew that faith, what grew that love, and what gave him the strength to persevere, to suffer. Suffer means to tolerate also. To suffer and to tolerate all the things that the Lord put him through. What pushed Festus over the edge? He kind of lost it when, when uh, Paul said that, you know, uh, the first risen from the dead. It just kind of blew Festus's mind right out of the water and said, your great learning has made you insane. And yet, what does Paul do? He turns to Agrippa and he says, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Because nothing has been done in a corner and the, the, all these facts are well known. Unfortunately, Agrippa did not respond the way he probably should have. He's probably regretting that now. But the fact is, is that he presented and he had the courage and the strength to clearly deliver the message of the gospel to somebody that is powerful. And he did it from a position of utter calm and utter power. He was, at that point in time, the freest man in that room. Chains or no. He knew what his destiny was and, and that he was going to spend eternity with God. I think that's pretty attractive. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? So Paul has seized the opportunity to change this to a spiritual battle, not just a, a, a trial against a heretic, as the Jews would have Agrippa and Festus believe. So what was the outcome? Okay, he, he and, and this is kind of what I, my, my, my takeaway for, for myself and I hope for you to a, a certain degree is through the trials and preparatory to this meeting with Agrippa, he was being prepared. He was getting ready. So when the opportunity presents itself, he's more than ready. He's more than ready to deal with how to present the gospel, and he knows just how he's going to do it. Who knows who Bobby Knight is? Anyone? What's he famous for? Basketball. Basketball. Okay, don't talk about throwing chairs, okay, because <laughs> I'm not going to reference that. All right. Bobby Knight said something that I believe uh, has application for us here today. I don't know that he's a spiritual man. Bobby Knight said this, everybody has the will to win. Not everybody has the will to prepare to win. What are we, what are you, what am I doing on a daily basis to strengthen my faith, to become more comfortable in the word of God, to become better at conveying the message of the gospel in some way, shape, or form on an everyday basis? That is what came out of this for me is that 
Paul was preparing his whole life for each opportunity to evangelize. And he got the opportunity to do this before King Agrippa and personal estimation, he hit it out of the park. Now, the beauty of this is, is that we don't have to take responsibility for the outcome, okay? This isn't about us individually. This isn't about me. This isn't about Greg up here speaking, praise the Lord. This is about the word of God working in our lives, our love for the Lord and the, the growth of our faith so that we are able in each opportunity to reach out and touch, even in some small way, those people we come in contact with who may have need. We don't know what that need may be. It may be a time of trial. It may be sickness. It may be pick one, okay? Church has said that we are the church of the broken. Couldn't agree more. Every one of us, well, let me just ask the question. Did anybody have any tough trials through the course of this week? If you did, say amen. amen. Okay. What are we doing to prepare? What are we doing to consistently stay in touch with the thing that is most important to us, and that is our faith? Okay, remember the, the lyric line from, from the song. What breaks the power of sin and darkness? What breaks the power of sin and darkness? The Lord of glory, the Lord above all lords. We have to organize our lives, if you will. We have to spend time doing things that are going to keep us focused on what's important. Are we going to have trials? Yeah, I mean, are we going to have distractions? Yes. Our job is not a distraction. It's something that we have to do. So how do we get ready? Uh, I, just think I found a couple of scriptures that I thought were appropriate. 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. How do you get prepared for that? You've got to be in the Word. You've got to be in prayer. And then in Ephesians 6, to put on the armor. And this is something, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that we have to do every day. We've got to put the armor on. If we do not put on the armor, we're wide open. Okay? And if we confess the name of Jesus and we are out trying to do the things that he wants us to do without the armor and without a faith that comes from being and the growth in the word of God, we're going to be, I don't think we're going to be easy pickings, but we're going to be a prime target. Um, who wrote screw tape? Who? C.S. Lewis. Remember what, what uh, he says, in, in, he says that, They didn't even pay attention to people who didn't pray. Which by extension to me means they don't pay attention to people who are not actively pursuing a relationship with our Lord. Now, when we're saved, we begin that relationship. That's the beginning of our walk. At eight, nearly the end of it. Can I get a witness? Okay, so. Getting prepared. Being in the Word staying in the word and understanding that during the course of our day we're going to have questions and issues and trials many trials if you will that are going to want to distract us away from our our peace okay what's the best peace of all i think it's the peace in philippians 4 6 and 7. peace that surpasses all understanding one of my favorite verses so our, our daily battles may not be on the magnitude of speaking to a king, but we can be a true and faithful witness to whomever we come in contact with if we're ready. Would you agree with me? Okay, do we have to make an effort to do that? Answer is yes. Okay. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to be prepared? Are we willing to win? Got to ask yourself that question because if, if, you're, if there's any hesitation, then we're not going to pay the price, Okay. As Bobby Knight said, everybody has the will to win. Are you willing to prepare to win in this battle for the Lord, for the church, for your faith? Our culture has changed dramatically. My personal opinion, it's for the worst. But if each of us on an individual basis can, by our witness, by our love of the Lord, by our, our time in the word and the way we 
uh, conduct ourselves can touch just one life, if we can just reach out once to one person and bless them, and in that effort, that person comes to know the Lord, to love Jesus, I think the, worth it, the, the effort is worth it. God blesses when we reach out to other people. We may not see the effect, okay? When you reach out and you touch someone, uh, they, they may look at you and say, I, I, I can't buy into that, Greg, or they may give you the look that says, I can't buy into that. But you don't know what's going on because it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work. That's the beauty and, and, and the wonderfulness of, of the love of God is it not about me, okay? It's just about me laying the information out there, reaching out to somebody, doing it in love and with the conviction that this is what our Lord would want us to do and I'm being obedient to him. And if we do that, God will bless. The other thing is, is we don't know what the outcome is going to be. You reach out to somebody and they convert and become a believer, we don't know if that guy isn't or that gal isn't going to be the next Billy Graham. We have a responsibility to reach out. Is it comfortable? Not always. Maybe never for some of us. But we still have to make that effort. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? The Lord of lords. The Lord above all lords. So Paul continues to grow in his faith. Through his trials, he's a completely different man. Though he was in chains at that trial, he was really only the free man in that room. The only free man in that room. Are we growing? Are we changing for the better? The question we each have to ask ourselves, and fortunately we don't have to ask anybody else. Certainly I don't want to ask my wife. What is the evidence we are getting to be a better Christian today than I was in the past? We have, to have, we have to be held accountable. We are going to be tested. We are going to have trials. We are going to have suffering. Is there something to look forward to? Somewhere in the Bible, I, I think it says, count it all joy. If you're not suffering... Is that a good sign? You can say yes. <laughs> you don't want to suffer? <laughs> well, I, I want to suggest, and this is one of the things that, that uh, I, I took out of this, this message is, is that we don't live in the times of Paul. And it, it's my belief that our attacks from Satan are, can be more subtle and they can be more persistent. They can be uh, an attitude in the general populace that certain things that we know are wrong are okay. That certain behaviors and beliefs are okay and they're not. In the Truth Project, and some of you are, are doing that, there's a, a phrase in there that's stuck in my mind and Del says, the truth by definition is exclusive. It is either the truth or it's not. And there is no in-between. There is no compromise. You can't not have a Christian view and compromise with a, a secular worldview. It just doesn't work. The blessing of that is, is that when we choose to do what's right, we are obeying Christ. And that's how he said he measures who his disciples are. So in the times of trial, when you have a question or you have some resistance, then perhaps that's a good thing. That you can then be forced into examining what is right, what is good, what is going to please the Lord. So what happens next with Paul? They ship him off to Rome. Okay. And by the way, I told Seth that's in the lobby, don't ever give me two chapters in a row like this because I'm brain damaged trying to figure all this stuff out. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the shipwreck story I found to be, uh, it, it, on the surface, it seems so simple, so 
Paul gets shipped off, you know, and they go up the coast and, and they start off across the Mediterranean and, and they get into this horrendous storm, two weeks long. I can't even imagine that. And uh, they end up getting shipwrecked on an island. So Paul does his apostle thing, you know, and he, he cures uh, Publius's mom or whatever. And then he cures all the people on the island who are sick and, you know, it's all good. So I'm looking at this over and over again. In fact, I probably spent more time uh, agonizing over the meaning of this particular passage because it just didn't jump out to me. So I was talking to uh, a friend of mine, uh, goes by the name of Jesus, and asking him very sincerely, what are we looking at? What am I supposed to see here, Lord? What, what do you want us to see what can I share with my brothers and sisters? And so I came up with this. Hopefully he's behind it. Um, the ship, to me, rep, uh, represents a kind of a, a secular aspect of our lives. Okay? And to most people uh, who have no spiritual grounding, secular is all they have. They don't really have a, a, a place to go or a book to get into like the Bible. They, they worry more about their job, more about the benefits of, of their efforts to be uh, prosperous. And so they jump on this ship. Uh, they sail off across uh, the eastern part of the, the Mediterranean. They come to a place, and they're wintering. They're not wintering. They're stopped in a place called Fair Havens. And Paul warned them, what? Don't go on. This is going to be a disaster. But... As secular people do, as material people do, they chose to go on. Under the direction of the pilot and the owner of the ship, they decide to head out, and so they do. So I, I see a decision being made there from the material side of the world versus the spiritual side. Here is a man who Paul, at this point, they don't really know who he is okay, or what he's about. And they choose to go with their material side, and they push off across the sea, and voila, they are hit with a, a two-week storm called a nor'easter. They're even, they even have these on the East Coast, by the way, and they're very, very bad. So two weeks they're being pushed across the sea. Stormy, clouds, rain, whatever. This whole time, they're not eating. They're, I wonder if they prayed. They're doing something to everything they can just to hold on. So what happens? They get to a certain point, and, and uh, they throw out four sea anchors, and they're just being driven across the sea, and they're just hoping for, against hope that they will uh, somehow survive because they all believe that they're lost. But an angel of the Lord appears to Paul and lets him know that he and the crew would be spared. And he shares this with a centurion. And the centurion, who was in charge of this trip, suddenly goes, he didn't say, I see the light, but... He believed Paul. Paul told him, all the people have to stay on the ship in order for us to be saved. Now, the amazing part of this is, is that you're in, a, in a, a hurricane force storm. You have 200 and, I think, 78 people on board your ship. Not a single one of them was lost because of the Lord's promise to Paul. Instead of four anchors being thrown out, had they believed in the one anchor which would have been the Lord through the messenger of Paul, they really wouldn't have had to have the hassle that they did. And, and that was the message that I took out of there, is, is that what Paul was able to do through his being, through his witness, was deliver uh, uh, something of substance that, that they could grasp onto. Uh, Seth pointed out that, that uh, he said he was stable. In Isaiah 43, 1, 2, first and second verses, he says, But now this is what the Lord says. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And then, my, like I said, my second favorite verse, or my favorite verse is from Philippians 4, 6, and 7. To be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and 
the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That describes Paul. It does not describe the other guys. But they get the vision from Paul and they go, okay, we're going to go with this. And then when they get onto the island of Crete, he reinforces who he is and what he's able to do by his actions with the guy who was running the island and all the people that they brought to him who were cured of, of sickness. So, that's a pretty brief rundown on that particular chapter, but I, I would ask you this question. Do we need an anchor? Do we need to have the Lord in our life? Do we need him every day? Are we willing to prepare to win by having him in our lives every day? Are we willing to commit time to developing our relationship, to developing our faith? That's a question each of us has to ask. And, and, and sorry, it's got to get asked every day, okay? And sometimes multiple times. Because I know for a fact that some of you lose your temper on the freeways. <laughs> Me? Never, okay? But those are the kind of mini trials that, that get us off focus. And so, before we pray, I'll ask this question one more time. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The king of glory, the king above all kings. So, let, I told you it'd be short. Let's pray, please. Abba, it's such a, a, a blessing and a wonderful thing to be able to come together to lift up the name above all names, to open our hearts to the leading of your Holy Spirit, to fall back into your arms with complete faith, knowing that you will guide us. Lord, I pray that each of us would surrender our lives, surrender our hearts, surrender our minds to your Holy Spirit so that we can reflect your love so that we can obey you, so that we can touch the lives of others, so that you can be glorified. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.